So today's speaker is going to be Akil. And Akil is going to present this is for his dissertation research. So as with all of them, he'll be presenting two of his papers, not all three, but to show that you know he has already completed basically two thirds of his dissertation work and therefore is eligible to do his dissertation presentation. He is not in town, so he will be doing this remotely. So for those of you who have not met Akil, you will not meet Akil today either, but you will hear from Akil and you'll hear about the- Hi everyone. Hey Akil. Good to see you all. So why don't you take it away Akil? Sure, thank you Dr. Southworth. Good afternoon everyone. I'm here today to present uh, the colloquium on my dissertation titled The Ecology and Impacts of Human-Animal Interaction Across Geographies. Human-Animal Interaction or HAI may be broadly understood as any manner of interaction or relationship between a person and a non-human animal. Research in this field is relatively new even though humans and animals have lived alongside each other for thousands of years. Such interactions can have beneficial effects for humans, improving our physical and mental health, as well as enhancing certain aspects of our daily lives. However, not all these interactions are positive or beneficial to humans. <clears throat> Globally, humans and animals are inextricably linked, and so is their health, as three quarters of emerging diseases originate from animals. <coughs> The role of domestic and peri-domestic animals and wildlife as conduits of disease transmission to humans are being identified more clearly now. Zoonoses, which are diseases transmitted between animals and humans, pose major public health and economic concerns worldwide. They're estimated to cause about a million deaths annually and losses of billions of dollars already. As pet ownership increases and has come to include new and more exotic animals, many people are unaware of the risk posed by their pets. Pet zoonoses are recognized as an emergent public health issue as well. Higher risks to human health posed by wildlife seem inevitable as humans come more and more in contact with wildlife, resulting from a greater access to and disturbance of the natural habitats of these wildlife. People, especially those from impoverished communities in developing countries, experience the greatest health burden from zoonoses, resulting from the livestock they keep, agricultural communities they live in, greater exposure to peri-domestic and wild animals, their lack of access to clean water, and reduced access to health services. Anthropogenic pressures, Additionally, resulting from phenomena such as globalization, expanding population, agricultural intensification combined with shifting climatic patterns have resulted in altered disease ecologies and increased contact between humans and animals. Emerging infectious diseases are predicted to create such events in the future as well, given the profound interaction between humans, animals, and the environment. The human experience is thus strongly linked to animals, and this is having an impact not only on their ecologies, but also their behavior. Now, moving on to chapter one, titled Human-Dog Relationships Across Communities Surrounding Ranomafana and Andasi Bay Mantaria National Parks, Madagascar. Madagascar, located off of southeastern Africa, is a global hotspot for biodiversity, home to a mammalian fauna that is not only diverse, but also highly threatened. Madagascar's endemic carnivores, the Euplaridae, are considered the least known and yet the most threatened family of carnivores in the world. Globally, dogs are one of the most abundant carnivores that are invasive, threatening both ecosystems and native wildlife. While dogs benefit humans, free-roaming dogs also threaten global ecosystems and wildlife. Free-roaming dogs can negatively impact native wildlife by harassment, chasing, direct predation, indirect competition, and novel disease transmission. 
The role of dogs as invasive predators of native fauna is clearly seen in the unsustainable dog predation of the marine iguana in the Galapagos Islands and the rock iguana in the West Indies. Communities around the world have sought effective management strategies for populations of free roaming invasive species. And the public response to such efforts tends to vary not only by species, but also by cultural norms. Since community level acceptance can drive community level compliance, understanding local attitudes towards free roaming dogs and efforts to control their populations are critical. Free roaming dogs are those owned by one or more individuals or families that spend most of their time unconfined and they're able to roam freely away from their owner and they may acquire some or most of their food from a source that is other than their owner. Large populations of free roaming dogs live in Madagascar and yet very little is known about human dog relationships and their effects on the local ecosystems here, which also makes it a conservation priority. Here, we report on human dog relationships, the behavior of free roaming dogs across two of Madagascar's flagship protected areas, Andasi Bay, Mantadia, and Rano Mafana National Park, AMNP and RNP henceforth. For the study sites, we included eight communities around RNP and 11 communities around AMNP in Eastern Madagascar. All of these communities were rural with high rates of poverty and large disease burdens, low levels of education, and they were predominantly dependent on subsistence agriculture. And their economies were significantly dependent upon wildlife tourism. Dog owners at these sites rarely, if ever, owned or used leashes for their dogs. And most of the dogs could roam freely. Domestic dogs lived either lived inside the home or lived within a fenced area near the homes. Traditional beliefs tend to influence the people that live in these communities closest to the biodiverse rich habitats in Madagascar. Such communities that live near and within these national parks have a higher number of taboos, also known as faddy locally, linked to wild species. In addition, both Rano Mafana and Andasi Bay National Park are home to some of the highest levels of biodiversity in Madagascar and contain some of its most endangered wild species. Moving on to methods now, free mobile veterinary clinics were set up by the Mad Dog Initiative, a local trap neuter vaccinate return organization and consenting adults that brought their dogs for free Pay neuter services or vaccination was surveyed after seeking permission from the village president, mayor, and elders. For this study, we only observed domestic dogs, which were those owned and spending majority of their time confined and acquiring all or most of their food from their owners. And also free roaming dogs, which were those owned by one or more individuals or families spending majority of their time unconfined, roaming freely away from their owner and acquiring some or most of their food from a source other than the owner. Next, the results. The average number of dogs per household was 3.23 for AMNP and 1.55 for RNP. The reasons for dog ownership among respondents were diverse, with the two most commonly cited reasons being instrumental, i.e. protection being 64.4% at AMNP and slightly lower at 52% at RNP and hunting being almost equal at both AMNP and RNP and also emotional uses such as companionship being 8.2% at AMNP and 12.1% at RNP. Most people in these communities, 98.5% at AMNP and 93.2% at RNP fed their dogs leftovers that included rice, vegetables, meat, corn, milk, cassava, saramo, saramaso, which is a type of a local bean, and ampango, which is a local preparation of boiled burnt rice. 
they were also fed commercial preparations of pet food and bones whereas most dogs around amnp slightly fewer around rnp traveled one or more days into the forest with their owners in both locations the dogs killed a variety of domestic animals such as chicken duck pigs other dogs and cats while there were 38 reported predation events involving domestic animals across amnp there were 31 across rnp for both the locations there was a significant association between the community's location and whether own dogs killed domestic animals or not additionally whereas the community's location around rnp was significantly associated with the type of domestic animal killed around amnp it wasn't in both locations the dogs also killed a variety of wild animals such as mice rats snakes tenrex wild birds such as kale and pigeon frogs wild cats hedgehog bat and even fossa a native carnivore there were 329 and 206 predation events involving wild animals around amnp and rnp respectively around amnp there was a significant association between the community's location and whether own dogs killed wild animals but around rnp it wasn't so community location around amnp mattered to how individuals and their families felt about free roaming dogs within their communities moving on to the discussion dogs were owned mainly to provide protection against predators sometimes although not trained to attack low numbers of respondents who purchased their dogs might be a reflection of the economic status and rural location of these communities and it was similar to findings in rural parts of the cochimbo region of chile where purchasing had also been the least common form of dog acquisition with respect to dogs hunting wildlife since hunting within protected areas is illegal survey respondents may have been hesitant to provide complete information for the fear of incriminating themselves or being negatively judged by their communities in some parts of madagascar dogs have been found to hunt lemurs and the peria peria cephalas thus the number of residents who hunt with their dogs may have been possibly higher than what we found similarly the number of owners reporting that their dogs had killed domestic animals may be underestimated as respondents might avoid reporting that their pet had killed a neighbor's livestock the higher number of wild animals killed around amnp might at least partially be explained by the finding that a much higher proportion of the dogs around amnp traveled one or more days into the forest with their owners as compared to rnp our findings of what people fed their dogs were also quite similar to those in urban dog samples in the capital city of antananarivo the fossa an endemic cat like mammal that is also unique to madagascar and its top predator were also killed by dogs previous studies of human attitudes towards fossa indicate that many people view them negatively because they have perceived threats to poultry and small livestock due to the fatty that they resemble dogs and consume the remains of villagers ancestors previously it has been seen that dogs may be trained to kill fossas in retaliation for the consumption of their poultry yet it is quite possible that fossa deaths caused by dogs were either underreported or unreported by their owners because fossa are an endangered and protected species under the IUCN although most owners across both sites negatively perceived free roaming dogs dog owners reported providing care and companionship to their own dogs which included a willingness to participate in veterinary care for them this behavior is consistent with previous research among australians as well as americans previous research in northeastern madagascar also showed similar negative effects from dogs on native carnivores present in the area next 
we look at the lessons learned, advances and opportunities. Human attitudes towards and relationships with dogs in Madagascar are diverse and need to be understood before implementing targeted control or management solutions. People's perception of dogs, population level effect of dogs, predatory behavior towards domestic animals and wildlife, how dogs interact with wildlife habitats and protected land and dog behavior are particularly important considerations while planning any kind of conservation efforts in Madagascar. Our results inform the complex and understudied human-dog relationships in rural landscapes of the developing world and highlight the negative impacts of free-roaming dogs on native wildlife, sorry, on native wildlife, and also make recommendations to mitigate them in one of the world's most important biodiversity hotspots. Moving on to chapter two, assessing the exposure and burden of zoonotic disease in rural Madagascar. Zoonoses occurring at the interface of human and animal health represent a significant threat to the environment, animal welfare, public health, and the economies across the globe, resulting in about a billion cases every year and disproportionately affecting poor populations in developing countries. Human mortality resulting from emerging zoonotic infections can vary significantly from about 100 deaths from the 97 outbreak of avian influenza to millions from the ongoing SARS-CoV-2 and HIV AIDS pandemics. Yet, in part due to their impact and management falling across two sectors, they are often neglected with their true impacts difficult to assess. Zoonotic diseases are also widely unreported, especially in impoverished communities. Furthermore, they are far more underreported as compared to non-zoonotic diseases of comparable prevalence, especially in impoverished communities. Their assessment is thus difficult because of their wide ranging impacts on human health and livelihoods, as well as animal and ecosystem health. In addition, very often they are complex, there are complex social and political issues around their assessment and management. It's estimated from the global burden of disease that zoonosis and re-emerging infections made up slightly more than a quarter of the dallies lost from infectious diseases. Whereas people in many countries maintain domestic livestock as a source of livelihood, it also exposes these people to the risk of infectious diseases. And these diseases affect livestock and not only are a significant threat to global animal health and welfare, but also to agronomic health and the security of national and international food supplies. They can also be detrimental to human health and the alleviation of rural poverty in developing countries. The direct costs of zoonotic diseases are estimated to be more than 20 billion and indirect losses at over 200 billion to affected economies as a whole. In this chapter, I use a framework that captures the costs of zoonosis and emerging diseases to human health in terms of the cost to treatment, health burden, and the intangible and opportunity costs incurred either directly or indirectly. Such direct costs can be the costs of travel and medicines and the time that may be missed from school or work due to illnesses at the level of the individual. Indirect costs include the uptake of disease averting behaviors, such as the use of mosquito nets, hand washing, milk boiling, etc., undertaken by individuals. Thus, it becomes critical to understand the interactions between humans and their domestic animals to assess the importance of zoonosis in developing countries. It helps to develop policies that control them and protect both human as well as animal health. Approaches that can handle the uncertainty, complexity, different stakeholders, as well as issues with social, economic, political, and environmental implications are the most appropriate in understanding zoonosis and their impacts. Here, we discuss the risk factors that might be associated with the occurrence of zoonotic infection and describe the various direct and indirect costs of animal-based infectious diseases 
at the individual level in a village in rural Madagascar. Data, 57 household surveys were conducted by the Mad Dog Initiative in, in collaboration with Association Mitsinjo, which is a community-based not-for-profit conservation organization. These were conducted in Andasibe village in June 2019. Andasibe is a rural village and a commune in the Moramanga district to the east of the capital city of Antananarivo and southwest of Andasibe Mantaria National Park. The study team included two native Malagasy who also spoke Betsy Misaraka, the local dialect, and were also trained in survey protocol and interview techniques. The survey was conducted in the local dialect and collected social demographic, occupational and animal exposure and health related data using a mixture of open and close ended questions with multiple responses allowed for several of them. Human health related data included that on the presence or absence of a number of signs and symptoms such as fever, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, headache, abdominal pain, cough, lymph node buboes, which are tender and painful lymph, nodal uh, lymph nodes essentially in the groin region. These are characteristic of a type of plague known as the bubonic plague, which is endemic occurring with epidemic outbreaks in Madagascar and also anesthesia within the past six months. Methods, there are several zoonoses such as salmonellosis, giardiasis, avian influenza, or bird flu, rabies, toxoplasmosis, plague, etc., that can be transmitted by animals kept at home in the study, causing the signs and symptoms related to the respiratory system, GI system, central nervous system, urinary system or the blood, all of which are often overlapping. So I ran a multivariate logistical model to look at the associations between risk factors and the presence or absence of at least one of these symptoms among the respondents. Further, I also looked at the direct cost to the individual, such as the cost from travel to access healthcare, purchasing medication, and the time missed from school or work as a result of disease condition. In direct costs to the individuals also included uh, disease prevention behaviors adopted by individuals to reduce their disease exposures. In the model, respondents having had at least one of the symptoms was significantly associated with them owning zebu and with keeping animals such as poultry, pigs, dogs, cats, and rabbits inside their houses. Animals kept within houses uh, are usually connect, uh, were usually kept at either their stores, which were connected to the homes, uh, freely allowed to move throughout the homes, or only kept within the homes at night. People also killed and consumed the meat of some of the animals they kept within their homes. Poultry such as chicken, geese, and ducks, pigs, rabbits, zebu, and rarely cats. Based on the model's AUC, it was fairly accurate in predicting whether the respondents had at least one of the symptoms. Also, most respondents were females and respondents had an average age of 39 years with only four of them having never attended any school at all. While most of them were homemakers 12.3% were farmers or crop traders, with the rest being health workers or construction workers, security personnel, tourist guides, teachers, cooks, tailors, store owners, or students themselves. Approximately 42% of them had a secondary occupation as a handicraft worker, farmer, hairdresser, a cook, security personnel, or livestock traders. So first, I looked at the direct costs associated with symptoms at the level of the individual, which includes the cost of illness to the individual, that is the amount spent both in money and goods to access healthcare and pay for medications, and the loss of time 
incurred from school or work. What we found was that 61% of them had sought some form of healthcare as a result of their symptoms. They accessed healthcare for their symptoms from a variety of places, such as a doctor, the village health clinic, predominantly, but also from traditional healers and their neighbors in equal proportion. About 91% of them reported having taken some form of medicines, which they got from either the doctors, the village health clinic, or a traditional healer. 84% of the respondents had paid in either money or traded goods for the medicines or travel for accessing healthcare to treat their symptoms in the past six months. Respondents also spent an average of 22 and a half US dollars in the treatment of their symptoms during the last six months. Most respondents had missed one or more days from their school or work in the past six months. About 68% of them having missed one to six days and about 32% and of them having missed a week or more from school or work. Next were the indirect costs to the individual, which included the costs of prevention, such as bed net use, hand washing and water treatment. We also found that bed net use to protect against vector, vector borne illnesses was at 84% with 93.8% uh, of them having used bed nets every single night for the past four weeks. About 81% of them said they treated their water prior to co consumption. Of those treating their water, about 87% always treated their water, whereas about 11% did so only occasionally. Respondents used either a cloth or a, gay or a gauze as filter or uh, by allowing the impurities to settle down. Next, most, almost all of them used hand washing as a means of sanitation. Respondents washed their hands with soap before and after preparing food, before dealing with children, before and after breastfeeding, before and after handling livestock, and whenever the hands appeared to be dirty. Moving on to the discussion, diseases such as parasitic infections, fungal infections of their skin, and tuberculosis, a respiratory illness, are widely present among the Zebu populations across Madagascar, which could in part explain their significant association with disease symptomology among their owners. Further, animals such as cats, dogs, rabbits, poultry, pigs, and zebu also are known causes of human illnesses that range from minor skin infections to more serious illnesses, including death. Keeping these animals indoors could also increase their risk of spreading diseases such as campylobacteriosis, cryptosporidiosis, brucellosis, hookworm, avian influenza or bird flu, salmonellosis, leptospirosis, and anthrax, to name a few, among the humans that are in close contact with them. Next, the average expenditure of about $22.5 in the last six months represents a large portion of their per capita income and thus a significant financial burden to the rural Malagasy who barely survive on about $1.1 a day, experiencing high levels of poverty at about 77.3%. Unequal access to healthcare among females as compared to males was similar to findings in other sub-Saharan countries such as Malawi and Cameroon. Although direct costs are also significant, indirect costs also tend to disproportionately hurt poor populations who may lack insurance and safety nets and often cannot adopt preventive measures without compromising their livelihoods. Zoonoses and diseases recently emerged from animals make up around a quarter of the infectious disease burden in low-income countries and represent a major public health problem, which makes it critical to comprehensively assess their burdens in local populations. DALIs have been an important innovation and are very useful at doing what they set out to do, that is measure the burden of human health in terms of death and disability. 
However, they fail to capture several important impacts, including the cost of human illness, losses borne by the livestock sector, and the impaired health regulating services done by the ecosystem. In low income countries, the economic and health burden associated with zoonoses is often given low attention or, or largely unknown. Quantitative data on the health and economic burden of these diseases may contribute to changing mindsets to make informed decisions on prevention and control of these endemic zoonotic diseases. Lastly, the study did have a couple of limitations. Firstly, the results, especially those related to the risk factors, need to be carefully considered as only a small number of surveys were conducted. Second, we were unable to test for specific pathogens on different samples within the homes, which limits us from making observations about specific zoonotic pathogens and makes the results more generalizable. Moving on to chapter three, titled Spatial Ecoepidemiology of Human Leptospirosis in Florida. Leptospirosis is a re-emerging disease caused by pathogenic serovars of Leptospira. The most widespread zoonosis in the world, it results in about 1.03 million cases and approximately 59,000 deaths annually. It has complex pathways of transmission and is dependent on human, animal, and environmental interaction. Pathogenic forms of the bacteria survive within the kidneys of infected animals and are excreted within their urine into the water and soil, surviving there for weeks to months. It is the only epidemic prone infection which can be transmitted from contaminated water. Humans can be infected through direct or indirect contact with contaminated water, soil, or the infected urine, tissue, or blood of infected animals through abrasions or cuts in the skin or the conjunctiva. Human infection can lead to a wide range of presentations from mild flu-like illnesses with fever, chills, diarrhea, vomiting, to more severe signs and symptoms, such as jaundice, abdominal pain, conjunctival suffusion, rashes, to more severe forms with kidney disease deteriorating into renal failure, hepatic failure, meningitis, hemorrhage, respiratory distress, and even death when left untreated. It has a case fatality rate of 5 to 15% among those with severe illness. Although the incidence in humans is relatively low within the US, it continues to be a growing problem in both human and veterinary medicine, having resulted in several illnesses and deaths in the US in the last 10 to 15 years. Florida has a mix of subtropical and tropical climates resulting in high humidity, sunshine, and warm temperatures. Also an abundant of reservoir animals, such as rodents, feral hogs, squirrels, raccoons, horses, cows, and pet dogs, all of which can carry the bacteria. Furthermore, Florida's importance as a destination for water-based recreational sports, such as swimming, boating, fishing, adventure sports activities, hunting, and farming, not only provide favorable conditions for leptospiral occurrence, but also make it critical to understand its spatial distribution across the state. The complex ecology of its transmission not only make it difficult to determine control strategies, but it has been identified by the WHO as a tropical disease of global importance, which requires further research into its epidemiology ecology and pathology. Here, I plan to study the spatial clustering of human cases of leptospirosis and its spatial drivers at the scale of counties across Florida state. Data, I will be using retrospective morbidity data on human cases of leptospirosis spanning from 1992 to 2019 provided by the Florida Department of Health. 
methodology, the available case data is aggregated at the level of the counties. And I aim to map the spatial variation in its occurrence, resulting from a set of animal, environmental, and socioeconomic factors in Florida by using a negative binomial regression model. Moving on to the variables that I will be using uh, in the model. Firstly, animal host factors. Previous literature shows that whereas animals, including rodents, pigs, feral hogs, dogs, cattle, and frogs were considered reservoir hosts for specific leptospiral serovars, others, including horses, sheep, and goats, are accidental or secondary hosts. Areas where humans come into contact with the urine of infected animals or urine-infected environments are a source of leptospira. Uh, data one, two, three, that is pig, cattle, pig, and horse density will be obtained from the fowl. Land, landfill sites will be used as a proxy for the presence of Norway rats, one of the most important reservoirs of le leptospira. And type three uh, landfills will be used because they are the only ones which accept municipal solid waste, which is commonly defined as household trash or garbage, which is what Norwegian rats are associated with. Next, the, per the percentage of canine microscopic agglutination test positivity rate by county will be used as a binary variable with values of zero for those counties with a positivity rate between zero and 30% and one for those between, uh, with a positivity between 31 and 100%. Next, environmental factors. Despite its global occurrence, tropical and subtropical climates with high rainfall are the most favorable for leptospiral transmission as leptospires survive for extended periods in warmer and humid environments. So first uh, is the precipitation in the wettest month of bio 13. Uh, next, the annual precipitation of bio 12. Then bio 15, which is the precipitation seasonality. Bio one, bio four, all of these will be obtained at spatial resolutions of one kilometer square from the World Clim data set. Next, average river density, which is calculated as the total river length in the county divided by county area using ArcGIS. Next, the distribution of fresh water, streams, lakes, and springs within a county used as a percentage of the total county area, again calculated using ArcGIS. Next, flood prone areas or zones used as a percentage of the total area of the county prone to flooding. Again, calculated using ArcGIS. Land use and land cover changes, various land cover types, such as scrubland, shrubland, deciduous forest, will be obtained as a 30 meter raster from the National Land Cover Database. Next, moving on to the socioeconomic factors. Leptospirosis has been reportedly not only seen in large urban centers after heavy bouts of rainfall, but also in remote rural areas that have limited access to clean drinking water. It mainly affects socioeconomically vulnerable populations and is hence considered a disease of poverty in several middle and low income countries as well. Firstly, the human population density particularly in more rural areas, could serve as a proxy for exposure to infested livestock. The county GDP, residential setting, leptospirosis cases have been reported in a variety of settings that range from large urban centers to more remote rural areas. The median household income in USD. Next, poverty, which exposes them to inadequate housing, sanitation, and higher vulnerability to disasters such as flooding, floods. This data will be obtained from the Florida Department of Health. And lastly, the percentage of literacy obtained from the National Center for Educational Statistics. Thank you.
For the published paper, I would like to thank all my co-authors, especially those in the field in Madagascar that helped collect this data. And I would also like to thank my committee for all their valuable inputs and feedback. Uh, any questions? These are my references. Carly, do you want to go first? Because I see your hand up online. Sorry, I thought that was a clap. <laughs> I don't have a question. I, I oh. thought I was clapping. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience here that's live? I have a question here online. Perfect. Thanks, Johanna. <laughs> so, um, Sorry, I, I might not have followed uh, every single slide because I, I have a baby here next to me, but I'm, I'm curious, um, so how come you, you chose these uh, diseases in these study areas? Because you're both in Madagascar and then you're doing Florida too. Uh, and if I understood it right, it's not the same disease. So um, what was uh, the motivation for choosing these places and these diseases? Yeah, actually, so honestly, one of them was, like I said, with Madagascar, we had a data set uh, that was actually, it, it actually resulted from a limitation uh, and given time constraints. We had a data set that collected uh, samples and we, that were sequenced for certain infections. However, uh, these, a lot of these samples had been collected uh, about two or more years back in 2019. So the samples had deteriorated to an extent where no DNA was uh, being able to be sequenced from the samples. And given the time constraint, I was actually supposed to travel to Madagascar in 2020 and again in 2021, which got canceled because of COVID. So I decided to use the data set we already had to a more sort of uh, generalized exposure instead of any particular um, pathogens. And next, as far as uh, the leptospirosis in Florida was concerned, uh, I felt like I've also mentioned, uh, it still is an area of concern and has recently become a, dis a re emerging disease in certain parts of the US. So I thought that it might be quite interesting to have a look at uh, what spatial drivers does it have within the state of Florida. Okay, thank you. Akil, this is Jason. Uh, wanted to have a follow-up there. You, you talk about your uh, covariates for Florida and you talk about uh, pig distributions. Of course, we, we've got quite a large cattle farming operation in Florida, right? Uh, second yep. only to Texas. Uh, not the case for swine, but we may have estimates are wide, right? But we may have as many, many as a million feral pigs in Florida. How, how are you going to manage that? I, I have some reserve reservations about you using that FAO data to estimate livestock distributions in Florida. I mean, uh, that is the best sort of data source that I have uh, got so far, which is, I think they are at about uh, 10 or a kilometer square uh, per square uh, resolution. Honestly, Dr. Blackburn, at this point, uh, that's some of the only available data that I could find. So yeah, I do understand uh, there are certain limitations which I am hoping to also address while I get down to uh, for analyzing and then writing up my results and discussion. Sure, so I would look at the literature, you know, there are some estimates of uh, how many wild pigs there are in Florida. And I think, I appreciate your limitation, but that may not, that still may not be the appropriate data set, right? I don't, I don't think that'll answer the pig question. And I, I wouldn't ignore it if I were you, because um, there are quite a lot of them here, particularly for uh, 
for a pathogen that requires the environmental transmission component of lepto, right? So, yeah. um, so I appreciate the limitation, but I, I don't think that um, that by itself, I don't think justifies using it only. All right. Okay, that is then something that I will uh, discuss with my committee again. And I would check, I, is Dr. Wisely's on your committee, I think, right? Yeah, that's Dr. Right. Wisely knows a lot about wild pigs in Florida, so I would check with Sam, because that's one of yeah. her specialties. I will, I will. Thank you for the suggestion. Any other questions here in the room? Yes. I, uh, I don't know if you can hear me from back here. So I'll try to project. Is it? <laughs> can you hear me up okay? I can oh, repeat it if not. Don't worry. I'll, I'll oh, yeah. Just here. Evan's a, running up. Look okay. at this. I'll stand here. Is this okay? Wait, is that the camera? I feel like we'll be too close when right. I stand there. Okay. I'll stand here. Hi. I <laughs> forgot my question. It's in my notes. Hold on. <laughs> Sincere apologies to everybody watching me do this ridiculous exercise. Um, oh yes, okay. So in the uh, second paper, when you were discussing uh, the in, the indirect costs, or more specifically the averting behaviors like bed net use, uh, water treatment, uh, frequency, the uh, frequency that people wash their uh, wash their hands, were you concerned about sort of overreporting of the frequency in those kind of hygiene behaviors? And if you I, if you were, and if you said something about how you handled that, I am. Um, Sorry for missing it. Sorry, could you just repeat that once again? The last, just the last bit. Sure. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you were um, concerned about how you can maybe address the possibility that people were over-reporting the frequency of their hygiene behaviors. So, for instance, how frequently they washed their hands, how frequently they um, were treating the water, and things like that. Because I think that's that kind of behavior is often, you know, people will fudge about how how frequently they do those sorts of things um, in self-reporting. So I was wondering if you addressed any of that um, in the model itself or how you account for that possibility. So that, that uh, actually that variable was not a part of the regression model that I had run. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you that these, these are all uh, self-responded uh, sort of interviews. So that uh, limitation certainly is there resulting from any kind of sort of social biases that they might have felt about uh, giving more favorable answers in the presence of the interviewees. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone online have any final questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Akil, for everyone who's in the room before you clap. <laughs> for everyone who's in the room, you are not allowed to leave until we have a photo. For anyone in the corridor, you can come down and join us for the photo, because I know some people prefer to watch in their offices. And thank you, Akil, and please make sure you get your review forms. They go to Josh, not to me. We don't want violations of privacy. So just straight to Josh and he inputs all that information for us. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much.